Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show that showed the profiles, the humans behind the big ideas that have shaped our world and are inspiring the future and future creators. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for this journey. Uh, so here we sit a few months into the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic and one big question on everyone's mind is, when will we see the first mass produced vaccine against this current strain, especially as it looks like they, there may be some loosening of quarantine or shelter in place rules uh, to restart the economy. Uh, I, I am honored uh, to be joined today by Dr. Stanley Potkin, uh, American physician, scientist, scholar, some refer to as the godfather of vaccines, although I know he doesn't particularly like that label, uh, who while in the 1960s, while working at the Worcester Institute here in downtown Philadelphia, played a pivotal role uh, in the discovery of the vaccine against rubella, uh, otherwise known as German measles, which is now used uh, worldwide as a key component of the MMR vaccine, uh, and has worked extensively on the development and application of a wide range of other vaccines, including polio, rabies, varicella, rotavirus, and cytomegalovirus. Uh, Dr. Plotkin graduated from New York University in 1952. He obtained his medical degree at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, uh, was a resident of pediatrics for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Hospital for Sick Children in London. Uh, in 1957, Dr. Plotkin served in the, as, in the Epidemic Intelligence Service of the, uh, the CDC of the US Public Health Service for three years. And then he served as a member of Worcester's active research faculty from 1960 to 1991. Today, uh, in addition to his emeritus appointment at Worcester, uh, he's emeritus professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and he works on a, as a consultant to various vaccine manufacturers, uh, such as Sanofi Pasteur, as well as various biotech firms, nonprofits, and governments. Uh, his book, uh, Vaccines, remains the standard reference on the subject today. Uh, he is also an editor with the Clinical and Vaccine Immunology, which is published by the American Society of Microbiology uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Plotkin, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on the show today. You're welcome. It's a real pleasure. Um, obviously, uh, there's not too many people in, um, in our space of biotech and life sciences that do not know your name. Uh, however, for people that are going to be watching and listening to the show uh, that may be outside of this space, if you could just take a few minutes to uh, go a little bit into your background of you know, your early interest in medicine and research, and if you can go back to those early days at Worcester with uh, Hillary Kapralski uh, when rubella first fell on, on the bench in front of you uh, as, as a project, uh, that'll be one. Well, so actually I decided at an early age to uh, go into the field of vaccinology, uh, influenced by two books that uh, are not widely read these days, one being Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff and the other Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I knew what I wanted to do from the beginning and um, going to uh, the Public Health Service, the CDC, and to Wistar uh, were important steps uh, in, that, uh, in that journey. I was fortunate, uh, you know, everything in life is, is by chance, and I was fortunate to have those opportunities. Uh, also, uh, I should mention in uh, fairness that I did spend seven years uh, working in France uh, for Sanofi Pasteur, uh, which was very educational for me uh, in that it gave me an appreciation of uh, manufacture of vaccines, mm -hmm. which one doesn't get in academic life. And as you said, um, I give advice to uh, whomever wants it, uh, but um, uh, it's at this stage of my life, I no longer have a laboratory, so all I can do is give advice. Well, it's still extremely valuable advice, uh, no doubt. Um, you know, I, I read a, an interview with you recently, uh, I believe it was in Science Magazine, and you were talking about how um, there are several dozen uh, coronavirus vaccine candidates now uh, in mm -hmm. development, various companies, biotechs, not only US, but elsewhere in the world. Uh, you're mentioning that, um, you know, unlike back in the days of 
uh, when you're working on rubella, now we, you know, the, the RNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, single protein, multiple protein. Um, I guess the question is, even with uh, some attrition rates, uh, a significant attrition rate that may happen, um, at the end of the day, for something like this, uh, if, if there's a handful of vaccines that result, um, who sort of makes the decisions on what we go with, um, hopefully sooner than later, but um, when we have this range of possible preventative agents presented yes. to us at some point in the near future? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, let me re repeat what you said, that uh, on the positive side, there are many more ways to develop a vaccine than there were when I first started to work. Mm -hmm. And so the numerous candidates that we have against what I prefer to call SARS-2 mm -hmm. virus um, uh, is, is pleasing in, in a way because it illustrates the development of vaccine science uh, since um, I first started to work in the 1960s. Um, but the question you ask is, is a fair one. So we have all of these candidates and how are we going to decide which ones to use? Well, uh, it, it boils down to, I think, uh, two points. One is, uh, do the different vaccines give the same protection or are there differences between the efficacy of the various vaccine approaches. And I'll, I'll come back to, to that point. Sure. And the, the second issue is how easy is it to manufacture mm -hmm. each of the vaccines, considering that we are facing the possibility or even probability that we will need not only millions, but perhaps billions of mm -hmm. doses of uh, vaccines. Now, of course, uh, if multiple vaccines uh, prove to be efficacious, I suppose it could be that we will ha have multiple vaccines to use and perhaps different countries will use uh, different vaccines. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's too early to say because there's one essential critical point that remains to be demonstrated and that is that prior infection gives you immunity. Okay. Until we know that, a development of a vaccine is going to be uncertain. Uh, so uh, I think those are the um, important issues for vaccine development. And um, of course, things are happening at different uh, speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, some companies have manage to get out there and into clinical testing uh, quickly. And so in principle, uh, they will have earlier results. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the other hand, if we are uh, in the need of millions or billions of doses, right. uh, the, the, the more vaccines, the better, because uh, we will need them for countries like India and China and so forth. You know, I, I live here in downtown Philadelphia and, and right across the street in our, in our housing uh, development here, um, Baruch Blumberg used to live uh, of mm -hmm. hepatitis B frame. Yeah. I met him a few times about 20 years ago and we used to have a discussion. I, I, I went in circles back then of folks that were working on hepatitis C. Uh, and I was always, you know, question, well, well, how can we have hepatitis A and B, but hepatitis C is so hard and he would say stuff about, you know, well, we got to get this perfect vaccine. It's, it's not perfected yet. Um, and I was, once I was looking at another interview of yours focusing on, on cytomegalovirus in CMV, where you talk about this, this principle again of getting, you know, having it perfectly, you know, this perfect vaccine at the end of the day, um, which, you know, brings a question, I, and, and, you know, maybe if this is <laughs> a little basic, but, you know, if, um, if there is a SARS-2 vaccine that, is ready by say the end of the summer that's 70% effective versus one next February that's 100%. 
how how is that sort of measured or how do those experts like you in the vaccine community look at things like that at what level does a vaccine you know compared to say uh, when we're developing a new drug uh, for say blood pressure or something how do we decide if it's efficacious enough or not well that's uh, a good question and a complex question because uh, it it depends really on the biology of the infection mm-hmm. uh, if um, uh, and the the reproductive number how infectious uh, is the uh, the agent so the answer can be different for for different diseases uh, in the case of uh, influenza, for example, mm-hmm. as you probably are aware, we, we don't have highly efficacious vaccines. Sure. And so w- all that we can hope for in using influenza vaccine is to diminish the severity of the epidemic, that is, uh, to um, reduce the numbers of infections and uh, try to prevent uh, in particular, try to moderate the seriousness of infection in uh, people at high risk, uh, like the elderly. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a vaccine, let's say like measles, uh, where you um, are facing a highly infectious disease, you need a highly protective vaccine. And fortunately, uh, we, we, we do have that. Um, uh, so we can stop the circulation of measles, but on the condition that we vaccinate essentially everybody uh, against the disease. So uh, when you ask, uh, will a 70% vaccine uh, be useful? Um, It it will depend on just how infectious uh, the uh, particular agent is. Mm. I would guess that a 70% uh, protective SARS-2 vaccine Mm -hmm. would have a quite important uh, effect on the epidemiology of SARS-2. Obviously, it wouldn't prevent uh, every case. It wouldn't um, uh, prevent all transmission, but it would certainly slow down the, the outbreak. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, one would prefer to have a 90 or 95 percent protective vaccine. Uh, but at this point, we simply don't know, as mm-hmm. I alluded to before. Sure. We don't know exactly what we need. And therefore, uh, the, the, the next year is going to give us that information. Uh, but Perhaps I could extend my answer to uh, another um, important point. Uh, You uh, mentioned that we don't, or at least um, uh, most people, uh, even in, in in the field, do not expect to have vaccines before um, early next year. And that is because the development of vaccines normally takes years. Mm -hmm. And even if we accelerate the the normal way of doing things, uh, as we did, for example, with Ebola vaccine, Mm -hmm. uh, it will take months before uh, we have vaccine that could be distributed to the uh, public. Um, Well, uh, I and uh, some others, a number of other people, have begun to advocate what are called human challenge experiments. Now, this is very complicated, and uh, anything I say is going to be oversimplification. But the point is that uh, if one can show uh, in uh, human volunteers, uh, especially young, healthy, volunteers that a vaccine can uh, prevent a challenge with um, a a laboratory administered dose of Mm SARS-2, that would speed up things tremendously because it would mean that if you could duplicate those immune responses that those uh, volunteers had or didn't have, 
that you would be able to know what um, types of vaccines will work and you, you could then uh, manufacture them uh, in large quantity without waiting for the usual proof of efficacy, okay. which is done by vaccinating thousands of people, or rather uh, va uh, uh, vaccinating yeah, thousands of people, but having thousands of unvaccinated people to compare with mm. so that you see what the rate of illness is in the two groups. Sure. Which means if you do it that way, inevitably uh, people will die in the control group and people will die in, uh, outside of, of the study. Right. So the idea is, and of course it's highly controversial, uh, is to subject a limited number of people to risk to treat them if they become ill, okay. uh, but to enable us to determine what kind of immune responses will protect. Hmm. I'll stop there. No, it's a, it's a fascinating theme. Uh, and uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate you presenting that because it gives you something else to think about uh, as, as we go into these topics. Um, on a related theme to this, um, can you give us your, your top line thoughts on, on the whole convalescent plasma uh, concept uh, as well? I know what's going on well, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts well, as an intermediary component to this? Yes, I, you know, that is favorable. Now, I, I'm not aware of controlled experience with mm -hmm. convalescent plasma, but the, um, the anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. suggests that it works. And this is very important because it suggests that if you recover uh, from um, the uh, SARS-2 infection, that you develop immune responses mm -hmm. that are protective. Uh, and aside from the therapeutic use of uh, such material, uh, it suggests that a vaccine could duplicate that. So those uh, data are really um, quite important, mm -hmm. but again, uh, we don't have, uh, I would say, definitive proof uh, that convalescent serum uh, works. Got it. You know, what, one theme that you brought up a couple times now, and I think extremely important as we talk about potentially billions of doses, uh, sort of is this manufacturing um, topic, uh, large scale production. And, um, you know, <laughs> About the thing is, is about 20 years ago, um, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Hillary Kaprowski over here at um, at Jefferson um, on, on 10th and Locust. I, I actually went out to the, the Pennsylvania Biotech Center, and, and the topic what we were discussing at the time were um, was the principle of um, producing vaccines uh, or vaccine components in plants, uh, namely tobacco and, and other um, plants that you could scale in large quantity. I'm very interested. I know you consult for a variety of companies and a range of technology. I was just very interested in your thoughts on some of these um, alternative production systems um, outside of traditional cell culture or whatever you may call them, molecular farming or whatever. Have, have you seen, I mean, this was about 20 years ago. I don't know if they, they were looking at making the rabies vaccine, I think, in, in tobacco, but any movement on this particular front uh, that you've seen over the last couple of decades, or is this and okay, well, first, first, first of all, let me say that uh, I really miss Hillary. He was very important in my life, okay. and he, he had great ideas. Well, nine of ten of them didn't work, but still he That's had biotech. great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, uh, he, he was a wonderful person. But anyway... Uh, yeah, those ideas of making vaccines in plants and uh, in tobacco uh, certainly were interesting ideas. And I have consulted for uh, in the past for companies attempting to do that. But I would say this at the moment, that it is doubtful that we really need those technologies. And I say that because 
our standard abilities, if you will, to make vaccines on a large scale uh, have really uh, improved. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is not to say that I would uh, exclude uh, somebody who came up with a way to make billions of doses in um, uh, in asparagus plants or, or, or something like that. <laughs> but but um, companies in the developed de developed world, of course, okay. have long been able to make uh, large amounts of vaccine. But the interesting development is that we now have companies in in developing uh, countries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are able to make vaccines at large quantity. It is perhaps not generally known that in terms of doses, the largest manufacturer in the world is the Serum Institute of India. India, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I, what I would say is that, and this is important, that if the companies, all of the worldwide companies, would get together now mm -hmm. and plan for the production of um, vaccines against SARS-2, and it could be different vaccines, but vaccines against SARS-2 in large quantity, then whenever we have proof of efficacy, they could start producing the material. But you know, you, you can't do that overnight. You have to prepare that in, in advance. And, and I think that the companies now should be meeting to make those plans. Of course, there are antitrust laws and all that sure. sort of stuff, but they should be suspended for this emergency mm -hmm. so that uh, from the moment we know we have a vaccine that works, that the companies can start producing in quantities that will allow vaccination to occur in Afghanistan at the same time mm -hmm. as it starts in this country. What, what, one other thing I wanted to ask you about while I, while I have you on this topic, and that is the um, sort of the some of the therapeutic angles to vaccination. And I'm not referring to um, say uh, cancer vaccines or things of this nature, but for instance, there's been a lot. Uh, over the years, for instance, with the BCG vaccine, uh, yeah, I obviously created a century ago for tuberculosis, but a lot of very interesting uh, potential immunomodulatory uh, dynamics, potentially uh, I mean, it's being studied up at Harvard for type 1 diabetes, um, other mm -hmm. autoimmune conditions. Any interesting um, non-infectious disease angles on vaccines that you're studying nowadays with, with some of your uh, your partners. Yeah, you know, this is a, a field that is long uh, been explored. Um, we, we don't have a lot of good examples thus far, but um, uh, for example, we, we do have a, a therapeutic uh, vaccine, at least um, a, it's not licensed yet, but uh, a vaccine that works against cervical cancer, okay. not the protective vaccine. That okay. is a wonderful vaccine right. that all uh, young women and men should receive. But there is also in development a vaccine for women, or, or it could be men too, uh, who have developed cancers due to the human papillomavirus. Okay. And... Um, uh, that vaccine uh, could uh, help people who uh, already have developed uh, cancer. Um, vaccines against non-infectious diseases um, where the Im immune responses are important in the disease, there are a lot of experiments going on. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, nothing yet has been licensed, but um, uh, perhaps, although it's not really a vaccine, but it should be mentioned that the field of um, of antibodies mm -hmm. uh, has really uh, has really mushroomed, so sure. that we have lots of therapeutic antibodies right. that can be used in people with chronic diseases. So that's that's uh, certainly not not trivial. Yeah.
Not at all. Not at all. It's fascinating when you see the, what used to be the top 10 pharmaceutical products in the world and all, now, now all antibodies uh, 10 years later. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's been an amazing trend. Um, um, I have to ask you this just <laughs> because of who you are, but um, get, can you give me a few minutes on what the hell's going on with these anti-vaccine people and how all this started? And, <laughs> and somebody that has sat in a position as you have and watched this unfold, uh, is this a collective insanity? I mean, what, what, what has happened <laughs> in the last year? Well, well, you know, ignorance is epidemic. Sure. And, um, you know, you have people believing all kinds of strange things. Uh, and uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, not just about vaccines, but as you know, about lo lots of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, let, let me say that the facts are as follows. Um, and this is actually a paper that, uh, uh, that is in press, but anyway. Uh, there is a vaccine compensation system in this country. That is to say, the, years ago, the, the government established a system by which uh, anyone or any parent who thinks that a vaccine has damaged her ch his or her child uh, can, um, uh, can essentially sue the government. Uh, for financial compensation. Sure. And uh, what happens is that it goes before a kind of a, of a court and uh, evidence is, is presented, uh, the science is looked at, and uh, if the government thinks that the vaccine uh, caused the um, reaction, or could have caused the reaction. In other words, that maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but it's at least logical that it could have. Uh, it provides money. Mm -hmm. So you could then ask the system, well, what are the results of all of that? So the, the paper that I just mentioned is very simple. It looks at the number of doses of various vaccines that have been given I think it was I think we did it from 2006 to 2016 but let's say over 10 12 years mm -hmm. and the number of compensations that have been given in other words the number of reactions that were thought to be legitimate and then you do a simple thing you divide the number of doses by the number of awards <laughs> and what it works out to is that for all of the vaccines, it works out to about one to two per million doses. So are there reactions, true reactions to vaccines? Yes. Are they rare? Yes. And are they protecting millions of people from serious disease? Yes. So that's the logic of it, but logic doesn't always appeal to people. Yeah. And so uh, uh, what, what can one do? Um, mm -hmm. You provide the, the, the facts and, and you, you hope that um, people will, will listen. But in addition, and this is, I think, um, one of the fortunate things about the US is that it was decided legally many years ago that it was the, the, the duty, if you will, of the individual to be vaccinated mm -hmm. in order to protect other people who, who uh, may perhaps cannot be vaccinated because of, uh, of underlying illness. Sure. So what we have in this country is mandatory vaccination. Mm -hmm. And of course, that doesn't, um, suit very well people who feel they should be free to do anything uh, you know americans can do whatever they damn please and and, and and so forth but it protects the larger number of people Absolutely. and uh f and fortunately uh, I, I think that situation 
will will continue with um, with with SARS two, although uh, humorously, I've suggested to friends that perhaps anti-vaccination people should not be allowed to have <laughs> SARS two vaccines. Unrelated to vaccines, uh, I read recently that uh, you learned to fly just a few years ago. Uh, something yeah. you always wanted to do. Uh, obviously, I guess you can't get out too much the last couple of months, but uh, how often do you go flying? Do you have your well, an airplane? No, I, What's the... Uh... You know, I, I, I learned how to fly in my 70s. Uh, I'm 87 now. And so I, I gave up a couple of years ago mm -hmm. because, you know, your, your um, reflexes uh, slow down, but it, it, it was wonderful uh, while it lasted. Uh, I, I don't think there are many sensations more uh, uh, pleasing than leaving the ground, <laughs> uh, uh, or for, the, for that matter, um, even landing if the wind is not too strong. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a wonderful sensation. And so I very much uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I'm very glad that I did so. Um, I owned a plane for uh, quite a few years. Okay. Uh, but um, now I've learned how to play the piano. Um, fortunately, my neighbors are not close. Ah. So <laughs> they don't have to listen uh, while I murder the piano. But it's, it's fun for me. Last question, uh, talking point, and if you'd like to take us out on this one, um, SARS-2, um, how worried, concerned, optimistic? Um, take, take us out on that one, if you would, uh, hopefully on a, <laughs> on a positive note. Um, well, you know, all predictions are likely to be wrong in some aspect. And I've learned that uh, the power of accurate prediction is really not that good. Sure. So, you know, in some sense, it depends on whether one is an optimist or, or a pessimist. I would say that from the science that we have now, there is as yet no reason why the epidemic should uh, abate uh, as long as there are susceptible people. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's why uh, isolation has been put in place because mm -hmm. we have no way of of, um, uh, of preventing infection aside from isolation uh, at this point. Now, uh, I suppose because this is a standard thing in in infectious diseases that if you have uh, enough of the people becoming infected then the, the organism would not be able to spread. But of course, if that happened, you'd have thousands and thousands of dead people, and that's uh, certainly not acceptable. So we have to try to stall the number of infections until we have a vaccine. Yeah. Um, could the, the infection disappear by itself. Um, unfortunately, I would rate the chances of that as being slim. Uh, it would be great if, if that happened, but I don't see yet why it should happen. Uh, and you know, each, each infection is, is different. It's, you know, you can't generalize a lot. The first SARS virus, SARS-1, mm -hmm. um, did disappear. Uh, because, I think, because it was very uh, uh, mortal, it killed uh, a high percentage of people, and you know, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a dead person can't transmit to, to other people, yep. and isolation was done very rapidly. Okay. That was the fortunate thing. Um, are there other viruses out there um, uh, in animals that could cause serious disease in humans? Absolutely, yes. And I have some pride in the fact that 
I and a couple of other people in 2015 uh, postulated that we needed an organization that would make vaccines against emerging infections. And that organization is called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. And they are in the forefront of making vaccines against SARS-2, but their remit, if you will, is that uh, when a, um, a virus is discovered that, uh, that appears to be able to spread in humans, mm -hmm. that you develop a vaccine a priori instead of waiting sure. for uh, an epidemic to, to occur. Um, that organization is supported financially by the Gates Foundation, the mm -hmm. Wellcome Trust, by a number of, of countries in Europe and uh, Japan, mm -hmm. but not by the U.S. Mm. Dr. Plotkin, this, is, this was a, a real honor um, spending your time with us uh, and, and sharing this knowledge. Um, for everybody that's going to be watching on the YouTube channel or listening on the various podcast networks, uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Stanley Plotkin, physician, scientist, scholar, Emeritus Professor at the Worcester Institute, Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics, University of Pennsylvania, Editor of Clinical and Vaccine Immunology. Pick up his book if you want to. If you want to learn anything about vaccines, it's just called Plain Vaccines. Plain Vaccines. On, yeah. you know, on Amazon. Um, Dr. Plain, thank you for everything that you do. Um, thank you for moving this story forward uh, as you have for the last few decades. Um, and it, is, it was a real honor having you on the show. And well, you're welcome. Thank you.